you probably know that there's CMK, CPK, PPK. So what does it mean? What is the difference between these indicators? And what's the deal with the standard deviation behind it? In this video, you'll find out. Hello, I'm Tom. Welcome to my channel, where we talk about continuous improvement in an industrial setting. And today's video is an answer to one of the viewers' questions from Naharaju. I hope I'm not butchering your name too much, where um, the question is, what is the physical meaning of the standard deviation in CMK, CPK and PPK? Well, we're here to answer such questions. So let's first dive into what are those three indicators and how do you measure them? Because that's very important to take into account afterwards when thinking about the standard deviation. And then I'll also explain how you get into the standard deviation or using a D2 table in the calculation and what it means afterwards in practice. So the CMK or the machine capability with a limit to one of the sides, the process capability and the PPK, the process performance, they are built up in a relatively logical way, at least the naming convention. Here, what we see actually the first letter is about capability or performance. So the CMK and the CPK, they measure the capability. What is our machine or process capable of? And this PPK actually measures how it performs in practice. And where do we measure what it is capable of or performs? And that's the second letter. So either purely the machine trying to eliminate all the external factors or with the CPK and the PPK, the process. So in a process capability, we would like to include things that happen around the machine, like different operators, uh, maybe a batch change, material changes, all within our standard process, but more than just the machine. And with the CMK, we try to really isolate what the machine is capable of. Now, how do we do that? When we determine a CMK, we take a whole set, and this should be about 30 to 50 consecutive samples. So we let the machine run, we set it so that it, it works nicely. Then we just let it run without resetting anything, without uh, dialing the knobs. And we just take a whole bunch but all consecutive. So it's very short in time, but you have a relatively big group. And that's why we can use a standard deviation. Now, if we jump first to the PPK, what we try to do here is to check the whole process. So we will take a number of samples over a longer period of time. And again, we are looking for well, at least more than 30 samples. So we're looking for a whole bunch of samples. And uh, we will just take them, you know, a couple from this batch, a couple from that batch, a couple from that batch. They, those batches should be the same product, of course, right? So um, you do take one process where you expect that the outcome value is roughly the same, right? So uh, we don't compare completely different products with each other. It's one process. But again, you take a whole bunch and then you take the spread and divide it by three times the standard deviation of that sample set. Now with the CPK, um, we look at the process, but then we take small groups, subgroups of sampling. So for instance, if we have uh, a number of batches, then probably we, we take one subgroup of five to eight samples from one batch, and then the next subgroup will be another batch where we again take five to eight samples. Because we have such a small group using the standard deviation, it has its problems. So what we then do is we use this formula. We take the spread and then divide it by a D2 value. But what this D2 value really is trying to do is to estimate the standard deviation based on the range that you get. So the, the spread, the range that you get for this one subgroup and knowing the subgroup size. So a D2 table will give you numbers for two up to usually 30. If you go over 30, just take a standard deviation anyway. And it gives you a number by which to divide what you got as a range. And by that, it again will estimate the standard deviation of the total population. Now to uh, go over it again, we have the machine, 
capability versus process. And the first letter will show you if we are doing a capability thing. So capability talks about what can it do or do we want the actual performance that we see when we just let it run. Performance takes into account all the factors you have in practice. Capability takes into account as little as possible. So we really want to focus on either the machine or one whole process. Now, when we know this, let's go over and check how you get the standard deviation into this. So when we are doing a CMK, we get a lot of consecutive samples and they will be somewhere like this in time. And then what we do is we check from this what is the average and what is the standard deviation. So there is an average in here. Let me just take another color. There is some average in here. Uh, we do know what the spread is. And from this spread, we calculate a standard deviation. And the standard deviation you will see will then give us a graph that will be wider than the highest and lowest values. And this is because we take a sample from our population and we are estimating the standard deviation of the entire population. And basically what the statistics tell us is, well, you likely got your samples somewhere from the middle because there's a high probability. The closer you are to the center, the higher the probability. So probably when we take a thousand or a million samples, there will also be a couple of them that are even higher or even lower than what you measured in this experiment. That's why you get a standard deviation when you take three sigma, so actually six sigma. Plus three sigma or minus three sigma. That will be higher and lower than your bounds. Now, when doing this, what you will do in your CMK, CPK, PPK, and then especially the K thingy, there's the difference. We just check if this fits within our control limits because this became our upper control and lower control limit. If three and three, so a total of six sigma is smaller than the difference between your upper and lower control limits, you have a CM without the K of one or higher. This one purely by estimating will fit in here 1.3 times roughly. So we'll have a CM of 1.3. And now we also see that it's not fully centered. If you look at this average and basically mainly this part and you check it on the upper side, you see that this is smaller than the bottom. This one is larger. So the CMK or the CPK formulas will focus on this part and they will basically tell you check the smallest part and then do not divide by six sigma but divide only half of this distance divided by three sigma. So it just checks the, the shorter side. Now when we're talking about machine capability or process capability or process performance, there are basically different ways of sampling. So these were all consecutive. What you will do uh, when you launch it into normal process conditions, so we're going for CPK or PPK, is that you take subgroups. So you will say one sample is a number of values. Second sample is a number of values. Third sample also. And what this does is it takes, if we check the capability, just one set, so the CPK, and if we take the PPK, it takes everything. And there is a, a small difference here in how you calculate it. 
the CPK will check the spread you have here. So this spread here and makes a small check, so a small standard deviation estimation. And there it will say, from only my subset, I take this difference and I divide the difference, so the spread basically, and I divide it by my range divided by a D2 value. But this is sort of an estimation for, again, your sigma, an estimation for your sigma. And because in the PPK, well, I now drew only 12, it should have a bit more. And at some point we say, okay, that's enough samples in total. We will do the spread really divided by the sigma. Do not take these formulas, by the way, they are not complete formulas. It is free sigma, the, the spread is calculated in a certain way, but this is what it is trying to do. So you take the measure of spread, and here what we do is we say, well, it's this whole thing, because all of the samples are in there, and we take also, also the standard deviation of every sample we took. Now, that's a lot of statistics, quasi-statistics. How does this help you? An example, say we are uh, we're filling milk cartons. The machine capability is if you set the machine to fill your one liter milk cartons, just let it run and you measure 50 milk cartons. Is there exactly one liter in there or not? How much spread do we see? Can this filling machine give us exactly one liter of milk in each carton or not? Then, uh, and we compare that to the control limits that we set. Maybe we accept plus or minus um, 10 centiliters. When we go to process capability, what we do is basically every day from each batch of milk cartons, but this may be four or eight hours of production, but the production was continuous, we take 10 cartons. And we check those 10 cartons and we check how much is the spread. So how close are they all to one liter? And we check it for today's batch. We check it again for tomorrow's batch, but that is already a different sample group. So each sample group is a number of cartons from the same batch where, well, we probably changed cartons somewhere uh, halfway through. Maybe we changed operators from one to the next shift, but the probability that the machine was reset is very low. I mean, we do not go over an entire cleaning step. This is one production run, and we just take a number of cartons from somewhere across the production run. Do not take them straight after each other. So do not take consecutive cartons. That's more for the machine capability. And if we want to know the process performance, or so the PPK, we take over a number of days cartons from different batches. And in this case, we try to get quite a lot. For instance, again, 50. And for those 50, we check how close were they to one liter and we take then the standard deviation as a comparison. And that's when we interpret these numbers. So first of all, we know that if the six sigma or three sigma here fits exactly within the control limits, we are talking about a value of one. So CMK of one or a PPK of one, they all have the same way of talking about this number. So one means your smaller side is exactly three sigma away from one of the control limits. And this basically means that you get something like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 uh, defects per million, uh, sorry, percent. So 0.1, 0.2% defects. When the CMK increases to about two, um, more than two is usually not needed. In fact, two is exactly six sigma, because you'll have six that way, six that way, and even the smaller side has six sigma of uh, difference between the average and one of the control limits. So then 
we basically never get into trouble. There is a reason why we still want a higher than one CPK, and that is uh, with the one CPK, maybe you say it's not acceptable to have 0.1, 0.2% defects, but in many industries, this would not even be so bad. The problem is in the one and a half sigma shift. So what we um, often say is that only when the process really shifts by about one and a half sigma, can your systems, your control charge, notice this. So what happens when this process shifts by one and a half sigma? If you have a CPK of one, you suddenly don't have 0.1% of defects, you get about 7% of defects. Now, if you have a CPK of 1.67, uh, so 1.2 thirds, um, that means that you have five sigmas in there. But if you then have a shift of one and a half sigma, you still get less than a percent of defects. And that's where the value of going to even smaller, um, higher CPKs, smaller spreads really kicks in. Now, as I promised, the practical use. When your CMK is low, so definitely when it's lower than one, it means that your machine, even when you do not touch it, when the material is not changed, so basically these are the most stable conditions you can get, still cannot perform within your control limits. This process will never reach a high PPK because the machine itself cannot even do it. A CMK below one means you really, really need to focus on machine setting, stabilizing it, making sure that the machine itself gets completely stabilized. And this probably means you have to reset a number of parameters. So you do uh, your Kaizen, your Six Sigma projects on finding which settings give you optimal stability. And then first you get that CMK to about 1.3, 1.7. CMK of two is very nice because if it gets significantly higher than one, preferably the 1.6, then the machine under very stable conditions can perform well within your control limits. Then we move on to the CPK, so the capability of the process. Now, if we know that the machine capability is okay and the process capability is quite low, so really at least one third, so 0.3 lower than the machine capability, then we know that other factors in our process are introducing a lot of spread. For instance, different operators, although with the uh, process capability, the operator effect is not the biggest, more likely changes between small batches, changes in uh, material that you move in, or the machine is sort of resetting throughout the time. But uh, what you usually do is you have a sub sample group that is still quite close together. So there's not a lot of extra um, spread or not a lot of extra variation being brought into the system. So when you see this, you know that you really have to look at short-term causes. And when we move down to the performance of the process, then we take a lot into account. So we really go over shifts, different operators, different uh, setups of the machine for the same product. But we will have um, ingredient shifts, we will have batch shifts all included. And if that one, again, is a lot lower than the process capability, we know that we are doing something between batches, be really between the times that we produce our product. For instance, we cannot really set up the machine in the same way every time, or each time uh, the parameters shift a bit and operators really have to search for optimal settings every time that they again make a certain product. So then we really check the basic stability of our process in a much longer term scale, really between batches. So that explained a bit further how to get that standard deviation into the different forms that we check the capability or performance of our machine or process. Now, the statistics behind it, um, it, it might require its own video, but I think it is better that you first understand what are we trying to check on what part of our machine or process, which 
sample groups do we take? And then logically from that, we take the statistics that fit with these sample groups and these testing goals. One thing I will say is all three are useful and you start with the machine capability. If this is not good, you don't need the rest yet. Make sure that one is okay. This is nice at the batch level and this is especially useful to compare how good you do between batches, how stable your entire organization is and hitting the goal every single time. So I hope you liked this extra explanation. I also hope it answered your question. If it did, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't done so already, and please let me know in the comments, in the questions below, if you have additional questions, because as you see, I'm happy to explain. For now, I wish you the best of luck with your Six Sigma, checking your process capability, but also as always, enjoy your continuous improvement journey.